Hey everyone, as most of you know, this whole Terrence Howard business has sent the media world into a frenzy, with so many pundits wanting to get some clarity on what it means for society when we can't even agree on basic arithmetic. Piers Morgan is one such pundit, so what's his take on all this? Now, I normally wouldn't be that interested in commenting on a Piers Morgan segment, except in this case, I was supposed to be part of it. On July 4th, I got an email from one of his producers asking if I would participate in a debate, citing as the topic, Terry, Candace Owens, Stephen Meyer, and public perception of science. Naturally, I said, yes, this is right up my wheelhouse. The segment was to be taped that coming Monday, and they had arranged for a mobile studio to come to my house, from which I would interact with peers and the rest of the panel. Then, early Monday, Monday morning, I was told there were issues with the LA crew and they couldn't get anyone out to my house, so I couldn't participate in the panel. I have no way of knowing if this is true or not. They could have decided against having me on the show for any number of reasons. It could be that another panelist requested I not participate, or it could be that what they said is true and it wasn't their fault. I won't bother speculating. But the panel took place and it consisted of Eric Weinstein, whose antics you are familiar with from my latest video on Terry, Brian Keating, a cosmologist from UC San Diego who does science communication with a mixed bag of quality, and a YouTuber named Tom Bilyeu who seems to have mastered the art of clickbait and whose relationship to the topic is unclear. What ensued was more or less the unproductive tone-deaf back and forth you'd expect. Let's check out some highlights. Trust the science became a mantra during the COVID pandemic, but in the years since, and partly as a consequence, a rising tide of people are doing quite the opposite, challenging the scientific mainstream is in vogue. No is this better illustrated than the recent viral phenomenon of actor Terence Howard on the Joe Rogan podcast. We are already swimming in dog whistles. Trust the science was never a mantra. Fauci said it one time, and science-denying propaganda peddlers pretend it's something every scientist says every day. And the people who swallow this narrative are not challenging the mainstream. They're just rejecting science. There is no mainstream science. It's just science. Science is not the media. It's not a set of opinions or ideologies. There is that which has been substantiated empirically and that which hasn't. Piers is already framing this dishonestly. Anyway, Piers plays a brief montage of Terry saying silly things, clearly taking the position that Terry is nuts, which he is, and then he plays a clip of Neil's response to Terry whining about how dismissive Neil was, where he emphasizes that peer-reviewed primary scientific literature, not Joe Rogan's podcast, is where science takes place, something that is beyond obvious to anyone who understands science. Can't the public get on board with this? Well, others disagree. They argue the old system needs to be shaken up. The questioning and challenging mainstream institutions and theories is the only real way to actually get to the truth. Yes, this seemingly sensible attitude is the excuse that science deniers use to conflate purely apolitical and totally irrefutable scientific facts with some kind of ominous corporate agenda. The government did the Tuskegee experiment, so I'm justified in pretending viruses aren't real. Big Tobacco lied about cigarettes, so physicists are lying about the shape of the Earth. DDT is bad, so basic arithmetic is wrong. That old song and dance. Nobody's actually challenging mainstream institutions. They're just looking for excuses to deny science they don't like. Anyway, Piers talks almost exclusively to Eric the entire time, so let's dive into that. Were you aware that Terence Howe was, was thinking this way, was moving to a place where he could even conduct an interview like that? Well, to be honest, uh, I didn't know who Terence Howard was, uh, so I didn't have a, an image for him. But had you asked me, I would have thought back to uh, Werner Herzog uh, doing the entire film Fitz Corraldo to test his engineering theories about how less technologically advanced people could move heavy objects ma uh, many miles um, up, up hills. He mm -hmm. created an entire film to test his engineering theories. Mm -hmm. Hedy Lamarr uh, famously developed spread spectrum technology um, despite being a screen siren back in the 30s and 40s. So just as I don't think it's very strange to find out that Steve Martin is an incredible banjo player, I don't find it at all odd mm. that a polymath like uh, Terrence Howard would have such theories. 
Eric is jumping straight to his script about how all of these amazing people outside of academia are making awesome breakthroughs all the time. Calling Terry a polymath is laughable. It's a word that means a person of wide-ranging knowledge or learning. Terry has never learned anything. He's not a polymath. He's not even a monomath. Confidently spewing complete gibberish about a dozen different topics doesn't make you a polymath. It makes you an asshole. But hey, Werner Herzog made his crew carry a big steamboat, and Hedy Lamar invented a cool thing. So we should listen to any uneducated jerk pretending to be a genius, no matter how many people point out exactly how nuts they are. I don't think that the theories about math and physics and chemistry are incredibly deep, so I'm going to push back on that. Mm. Um, but I do think that uh, he knows quite a lot about many things, and he doesn't know what he doesn't know. Yes, his theories aren't very deep, also known as word salad he spews in a manic state to sound intelligent. The fact that Eric refers to Terry's ramblings as theories, or pretends that Terry possesses any actual legitimate scientific knowledge of any kind, is all you need to hear. Eric needs to pretend that Terry has something in order to paint academia as the bad guy for ignoring him, which is the only thing he is here to do, since that's his big gripe too. I mean, Neil deGrasse Tyson said that he, he, you know, people can know enough to sort of ask questions and stuff, but maybe not enough to know when they're wrong. In other words, when they're presented with, you know, quite complex science that has been peer reviewed and is de deemed to be established scientific fact, that he doesn't know enough about the detail to understand why he's wrong to question it. You mean the Dunning Kruger effect, as yeah. Neil said? Yeah. It's kind of ironic, actually, because it feels to me like Neil deGrasse Tyson is himself a victim of the Dunning-Kruger effect when it comes to peer review. This is pathetic. Neil explained how Terry has no idea what he's talking about as politely as humanly possible. Eric turns right around and says that Neil exhibits the Dunning-Kruger effect when it comes to peer review. Well, that's a bit funny. Has Neil published any peer-reviewed primary scientific literature? Why, yes, he has. He was the primary author on about 10 papers back in the 80s and 90s when he was a working astrophysicist before becoming a science communicator. It's not a huge number. He didn't revolutionize the field by a long shot, but he was a working scientist who knows how to do and publish science. What about smarty pants Eric Weinstein? Yeah, that's a big fat zero. Eric has never published anything scientific in his entire life. When he spews his pageantry about about geometric unity, he even prefaces it by announcing that he's not a physicist, but an entertainer. He bends over backwards to distance himself from the scientific community, yet continually acts like he is part of it, referring to real scientists as his peers and as my community. His community is podcasters and pundits. So what could he have meant by this comment? As his comments about Sir Arthur Eddington, uh, using the 1919 total solar eclipse um, to prove that Einstein's theory about uh, a star warping space, in, in particular our sun, uh, appear to be borne out. Um, Neil claims that that was sent to a peer-reviewed journal, whereas peer review doesn't really begin in physics uh, and in the sciences really until the 60s and much more the 70s. So it's very interesting because Neil himself doesn't appear conversant in the history of science and reviewing. Ah, yes, a pointless semantic gripe. Prior to peer review, there was editorial review. The point is that Einstein had a theory which made concrete quantifiable predictions. Those predictions were vindicated to high precision, and he published his results. Terry makes pointless shapes and regurgitates random words he doesn't understand while pretending to be smarter than Einstein. But it's Neil, the professional science communicator, who is ignorant of the history of science. This is absolute madness. Isn't the reality of all science a bit like with medicine, that a lot of very smart people take a, little, a look at a lot of available data, but maybe not enough to reach absolute definitive conclusions, and they espouse theories which their peer group then look at and discuss and analyze and argue about, and that's how we progress with science. 
over decades, centuries, and so on. I mean, isn't this, isn't this part of the evolution of science? Is that people like you and Neil deGrasse Tyson might vehemently disagree about stuff. Well, he was doing pretty well until he mentioned Neil and Eric. Yes, science progresses by scientists doing science and then discussing it with one another. Neil and Eric are not scientists. Neil used to be, and Eric never was. But in general, who could disagree with science progressing by scientists doing science? Eric sure can. My claim is, is that in general, we avoid dust-ups um, for fear of looking foolish. And I think it's fine to avoid dust-ups when you feel that there's an ethical problem with the other person. But in general, science progresses by a large variety of different channels. Uh, Benjamin Jesty famously observed that his milkmaids weren't dying from sm uh, smallpox, but they did get cowpox, so he inv injected his entire family with cow pus. Yeah, scientists don't want to talk about Terry's insane ramblings because they are afraid of looking foolish. That makes perfect sense, because new science comes from lay people all the time, such as the famous cowpox example from 250 years ago and very few other examples. How predictable. Science does not progress by a large variety of different channels. It progresses by scientists doing science. That doesn't mean someone like Terry should be dismissed outright just because he's an actor, but he certainly can be dismissed the moment he opens his mouth and starts spewing his ridiculous script, which is nothing but falsehoods by Eric's own admission. But what percentage, so for example Eric, what percentage of what he was saying was true or at least vaguely sensible and what was completely very little right so so my question if it was genuinely very little him getting tens of millions of views for espousing complete nonsense in the main and then someone yeah. with your pedigree and your knowledge of this subject matter going on and kind of going along with engaging him as a serious person in these in these things well, is, is just, that not in its start. own way diminishing science when you do that? Piers doesn't say smart things too often, but this was one of them. Yes, Eric, since you acknowledge routinely that everything he says is bullshit, why would you go on Rogan's show and pretend there was anything to it? First of all, I wouldn't have had Terrence on the first time because it didn't do him a service to what he actually is doing that's interesting to give him this amount of air. That, that was a good friend of mine's choice. Mm. So partially what you're seeing is a relationship between a comedian, Joe Rogan, and a mathematician, Eric Weinstein. Eric accidentally answered this question way too honestly. He flat out admits that he went on with Terry, who never should have been there in the first place, because he loves going on Joe's show and getting the boost in popularity. Um, Joe's a buddy of mine, and uh, he matters to me. And he he's the one who asked me to come on. Mm. It, it's... Uh, you know, some people have tried to frame it as if I wanted to go on. I had no interest. Really? That's not what Joe said. And then my friend Eric reached out and he said he would love to do it. Joe says you reached out to him. Are you calling your best pal Joe a liar, Eric? If he has a great idea, I would suggest to you it's likely his concept of a six-rotor uh, drone called, that he calls the linchpin that's based on a mathematical error where he's fit uh, six um, pentagons uh, through the edges of a regular tetrahedron, giving him six degrees of freedom, which span uh, what we would call the Lie algebra of the affine group, giving him the ability to rotate around a, a center and move to any point in three-dimensional space. It's a, an incredibly cool idea. Now, I don't know that it's his. I believe that it's his, but I don't know that. I haven't done that work. I'm not a drone operator, so I don't realize you know, what the state of the art is. Becoming familiar with the state of the art for drones ought to be a prerequisite for you to proclaim that he has a brilliant, innovative drone, Eric. And for the record, it isn't. This drone blog specifically states that multi-angled, multi-motor drones already existed. And Terry didn't develop his. He paid other people to do it. So any ounce of innovation that came about belongs to them. They just made it look like Terry's dumb shape. But I'm glad you had a chance to throw in some obscure mathematics terminology for no reason. And for all of this talk of the Neil deGrasse Tysons, where they say, I'm so pleased to see active minds engaging with 
the world of ideas. They're, they're really not. That's not what Terry is doing. He's actively disregarding the entire body of scientific knowledge and pretending his delusions are better. It's an enormous insult to the scientific process and every scientist alive. You know, my feeling about this is pretending that Terrence Howard is a fool or an idiot um, is, is repugnant to me. I mean, if you just take what he said about tones in the periodic table, uh, because of uh, some good fortune in my life, I was able to go out to none other than one of the greatest musicians now living, Stanley Jordan, mm -hmm. and say, Stanley, um, you, you know, let's share your work on playing the periodic table by using the ionization energies as frequency information, much the way Terence was discussing. Everything Terry says about the periodic table is wrong, and we already talked about how ionization energies are not sounds, making this idea meaningless, and also totally different from all the bullshit Terry said about the periodic table anyway. Even if you take the energy of the photon that ionizes the atom and convert it to frequency, you're still referencing a photon and not an atom, so there's just nothing to talk about here. My feeling is, is that a lot of my colleagues just don't have enough knowledge and even though they're supposedly the academics sitting in professorial seats, they're not behaving like professors. They're not behaving like uh, academicians. They're making fun of somebody because it allows them to work out their own personal insecurities. And that's not going to happen on my watch. Yes, giggling in private about Terry fumbling second grade math is totally a way for brilliant scientific minds to work out their insecurities. Oh, whatever would we do without Eric here to step in and put everyone in their place? Good Lord, what a sanctimonious jackass. Staggering to me that Terrence Howard has gone through life as a movie actor is suddenly doing stuff which is, to you, quite groundbreaking in the very complex world of science and mathematics and so on. It's not in science and it's not in mathematics. Right. If he's doing something that I recognize, it's in engineering, art, and it's possible that he's doing something you know, I, I was able to recognize where his shapes come from, where Neil does not appear to understand, which is fine. Um, so, you know, th there's some very beautiful geometry. Eric just can't stop attacking Neil to a degree that would only be reasonable if Neil had sex with Eric's wife. He is pretending Neil doesn't understand Terry's shapes and doesn't appreciate his art when that was the one thing Neil was extremely generous about in order to smooth over his blunt appraisal of Terry's science illiteracy. He specifically cited the illustrations as beautiful works of art. What Neil did is really troubling. What he did is, is that he advertised a fake openness, which is just submit what your work is to a peer-reviewed journal. Neil doesn't, either doesn't know the history of peer review, doesn't know why it's called peer review, uh, has no concept of what peer review actually is, which is bizarre. It's not fake openness. Entertaining the delusional ramblings of a clueless toddler does not make you open-minded. And knowing when someone is objectively wrong does not make you closed-minded. And the whole concept of peer review, the word peer isn't like a jury of your peers, your fellow citizens. It's like peers as in, ter in terms of the House of Lords. The whole idea of peer review is to keep the laity the, the, the people who don't do science for a living or medicine for a living, out of the review process. No, genius. The point is for scientific research to be reviewed by people who actually understand it, those being other scientists. How the hell are lay people going to review cutting-edge research in theoretical physics, you nitwit? This is like pretending that professional basketball teams have tryouts just so they can keep average people out of the NBA. It's so not fair. Why is it that only people who are really good at basketball get to play professional basketball? Anybody should be able to play on any team they want. These are the same types who chastise the left for inclusiveness and participation trophies, yet he pretends that there is some conspiracy to keep people who don't understand science from reviewing a bunch of science they don't understand. Is it damaging when everybody on social media suddenly becomes an epidemiologist, whatever it may be, you know, any different type of science you like, um, or medical expert, whatever. When, they, when their views get amplified, like Terence Howard, if they're completely wrong, 
they get amplified and shared. Apart from Piers' inability to pronounce epidemiologist, this is another solid question. Is it damaging when every willfully ignorant jerk in the world acts like an expert and spreads false information? The answer is yes. So let's see how Eric fumbles this one. The greatest damage is when we amplify pseudoscientists who happen to be official pseudoscientists. Eric predictably dodges the question because those clueless assholes pretending to understand epidemiology are his target demographic. So who is this official pseudoscientist as though that means anything whatsoever? So when you take a director uh, of uh, NAI, uh, National Institute for Allergies and Infectious Disease, and you take that person's uh, contradictory pronouncements, and you amplify those, then suddenly everybody has to learn what mRNA is mm. because they're trying to make a decision for their child. And suddenly you've thrust them into advanced biology because you've amplified pseudoscience coming out of the National Institute of Health. Advanced biology? Everyone was supposed to learn what mRNA is in ninth grade. And weren't you just a moment ago whining about how lay people should have a say in the scientific peer review process? So anyone off the street should be able to review highly complex molecular biology research, but they shouldn't be expected to have learned ninth grade biology? That sure makes a whole heap of sense. And of course, he's talking about Fauci. So what were these contradictory pronouncements? I assume he's talking about when Fauci said don't wear masks because he didn't want everyone panic buying masks. And then later he said, yes, wear masks. I'll give him that one. It's a bit frustrating to be manipulated like that, but that's really his big gripe. Not the tens of thousands of people telling everyone not to get vaccinated because it has a microchip from Bill Gates. What you're seeing is a failure of science to disavow public health. Public health is not science. Public health is an incredibly bizarre field that tries to straddle two worlds of actual truth and the noble lie. Public health isn't science, you guys. Immunology, epidemiology, virology, these aren't science at all. It's crazy mumbo jumbo. This is the script of a fraud. Public health is both a scientific issue and a public issue. It's where science and politics collide. So it's where you see the politicization of unbelievably trivial scientific facts in order to wage a culture war. All of a sudden, the obvious fact that being near each other increases the odds of spreading communicable disease is lies from the corrupt left. It's preposterous. It is a common tactic of the right to over-politicize basic facts about public health. There are a couple of mildly reasonable gripes, like Fauci flip-flopping on mask efficacy or lying about the measly 600K that went to Wuhan for research, but it's just not that significant. The excuse of distrust in government to explain the rejection of basic irrefutable scientific facts is ludicrous. I don't trust the government, therefore viruses aren't real, the earth is flat, and one times one equals two? This attitude is shockingly prevalent. When people espouse this attitude, which administration are they resisting? Which political institution are they raging against? Ancient Greece? Anyway, it's time to bring in the rest of the panel. Your, your response to what you've just been hearing from Eric... Well, I think as scientists, we have a responsibility. You know, Eric's uh, known for coining the term the intellectual dark web. And I feel like as scientists, we have a responsibility to keep, uh, you know, the environmental, intellectual environment clear of pollution. And I feel like there is a tendency because of this anti-authoritarian moment that we seem to be in to view science as authoritarian and then to rebel against it. We look to heroes and people like Terrence or Candace Owens or or people like um, Tucker Carlson, and they get enormous platforms because of their social media stature. But to me, you know, to listen to people uh, who have no domain expertise and no proven track record is an affront to actual practicing scientists. We have to look at and examine these claims that amateurs can do good science. And, you know, Eric pointed out in the interview that there's some babies in with the with the bathwater. 
And I'd love to ask my dear friend Eric to expound upon those particular babies, because to me, to say that there might be some angle or something like that or some drone, or it sounds to me a little bit like damning with faint praise as well, because if you go through and, you, and there's 97 patents that he claims he has, we go through them, we find out that very few of them have been granted. Uh, there may be a couple that have been granted. Uh, you go through one times one equals two. Eric demonstrated clearly that's not the case. You go through the periodic table. Uh, his his ideas are completely wrong there. His claims about gravity and building planets, that he's built the planet Saturn or it comes out of a biological digestive process of the sun. These things are complete, completely uh, fall fallacious. So I think there's a danger and it's a, it's a symptom of the halo effect. Brian comes out of the gate eager to position himself as the voice of sanity here, and for pretty good reason. He's well known as a crony of Eric's, having regularly enabled his posturing about academia, and he's been sympathetic to propaganda peddlers like Discovery Institute, as well as anti-vaxxers like RFK, so he's probably been getting some blowback for it. It seems like he is aware of how disingenuous Eric is in being charitable to Terry, and he's jumping ship to defend the scientific community. How will Eric respond? The baby and bathwater. What would you say to uh, to Brian Keating's point there? Well, I tried to say it already, that if you take um, the vertices of a tetrahedron uh, as measured from the center, you're looking at an angle of the arc cosine of minus one third, which is about 109.47 in degrees. And if you take the interior angles of a regular pentagon, it's 108. So 108 is not 109.47 but it is close enough so that within engineering tolerances, you can put six of these motors into a regular tetrahedron. Yeah, that's enough. The other two guys are smiling to themselves as if to ask why the hell Eric is trying to explain any of this here. Of course, we all know why. He has chosen the drone thing as his excuse to pretend we shouldn't all ignore Terry. And he validates this position by saying words like arc cosine and tetrahedron so that everyone will just nod their heads and believe him. But in general, Eric isn't having this mutiny from Brian. Brian, I was, I was very surprised that you just corrected me on social media. Now, of course, we're, we're friends, and so I don't mind having this back and forth. But you stated that in my field, um, that uh, peer review is much older than uh, Ghislaine Maxwell, who was born in 1961. And it's, you cited a bunch of journals in physics. And in fact, that's simply not true. Again, that peer review became the norm in the 60s doesn't mean it didn't exist prior, and there was always editorial review. But Brian isn't even given a chance to respond because Eric is off on another rant. They then say, I keep hearing that science is for everyone and that mathematics is a great place to play. There are no bad questions. And then when they appear to take an interest, uh, we cut their heads off. But they aren't taking an interest, Eric. Terry has no interest in science. The people who fall for his gibberish have no interest in science. Science deniers aren't interested in science or asking questions. They are just denying science because they hate science. That's the point. Eric can't help but steer absolutely everything back to this pathetic narrative, where he acts like the white knight for the persecuted sector of the public that wants their profound ignorance to be worth as much as real knowledge. What we've done is we've gotten rid of all of the dissenting experts. And the dissenting experts who are going to get up and at the top of their lungs say, hey, we've got a disaster in theoretical physics at the moment. Uh, we have an abomination in the way in which we are pretending that uh, random mutation is decidedly the, uh, the main engine of Darwinian selection. People who say things like what you just said are not dissenting voices, Eric. They're frauds like you pretending to have a theory of everything that academia ignores for no reason and fundamentalist Christian theocrats. You are describing anti-science charlatans and pretending they should be regarded as dissenting voices. Is Discovery Institute writing your scripts for you? that it's, it's more expensive to get rid of your dissenters who actually know what they're talking about than it is to open it up to a public that wonders whether they've just end, you know, shortened the life of their child by giving them an unnecessary experimental pseudo-vaccine. 
Yes, the experimental pseudo-vaccine, also known as a not-experimental actual vaccine. Let's listen to those dissenters who don't know what vaccines are. Good call, Eric. Does anyone else have something to say? Tom, what's your perspective on this? So I think the key thing to understand is if you're arguing at the level of the specifics of the science, you have already lost. So the goal here has to be to understand that we are living in the age of conspiracy, and that is the problem. When I saw the interview with uh, Terrence Howard and Joe Rogan the first time, I just about dislocated my finger dialing Eric to call him up to be like, hey, you have to refute this stuff. And the reason that I was very excited to see that he went on and did that and did that so well, Eric, you are a national treasure. Tom initially offers the correct sentiment, though sadly it seems that he's another one who's been suckered into Eric's web of narcissism, so he doesn't realize he's not the guy who should be refuting Terry and that he did a horrible job. Uh, Is that it does not matter to me what the elites think in isolation. If by elites you mean scientists, then it should matter to you what they say about science in isolation, since they're the ones who actually understand science. All that happens is, if people have an idea that hits a critical mass, they they begin to bifurcate. I mean, this is like the multiverse, where we no longer have a shared vision of what is true. That has second and third order consequences that I think are going to be terrifying for the nation. Yes, our society is splintering because huge groups of people are in complete denial of reality, and Tom is justifiably terrified about that. You have to understand, because of a whole host of things, but certainly COVID being a nice uh, mile marker for us, it broke people's trust in elites to lead us properly. It broke our trust in science. And we are back to pretending that scientists are to blame for the science denial that came out of the pandemic, instead of propaganda peddlers that polarized the population against science. How long will it be before we can drop this charade? Not anytime soon, because here comes Candace Owens why I am now rejecting the cult of science. So many things that they've lied to us about, vaccines, birth control, people that are being injured, and we just accept everything. What I said was that science has become a pagan faith. Yes, that's what I actually believe. Do you want to say that NASA has satanic origins and so on? Now, I interviewed Candice myself recently, and she's she's a a bona fide anti-vaxxer, doesn't believe in vaccines at all. And she has a big following. And there are lots of people like her out there now saying that because there have been legitimate areas of concern around the COVID vaccines, um, that everything about them is flawed and wrong. And therefore, all the scientists who promoted them uh, are the devil. It means that scientists can never be wrong again. Because if they're wrong about any one aspect of a big thing like a COVID pandemic, which is fast moving and evolving and changing, if they're wrong about any aspect of it, the whole thing gets trashed by this community. Here's this. This is why we have to understand that this is about the age of conspiracy. The very thing that Eric, I well, think, I agree, is I trying agree to with you about that, yeah. is to say science is about figuring out where we are wrong. And if Mm. scientists stake their reputation, as they have done over the last four or five years, entirely on always being right, then if I can pull one thread and it falls apart, everything is dead. But if science just gets behind Feynman's statement that this is about distrusting experts and figuring out where they're wrong, now it can become a far more fruitful pursuit of what actually works. This is totally idiotic. It's just another mountain of gaslighting over COVID vaccines and pandemic response, to which Tom replies that scientists pretend they're infallible, which they don't, and that we have to be all about distrusting experts, a thing which Feynman didn't say and that we absolutely shouldn't do. Arbitrarily distrusting millions of people who do science for a living is the cornerstone of widespread science denial that will be the death of human civilization. Brian, Brian, your thoughts on that? Yeah, Tom, just because someone's an expert doesn't necessarily mean that you have to distrust them. The world is full of unrefuted BS. And to put that on scientists, to make us sort of the uh, uh, intellectual SEAL Team 6, where we can never be wrong. The terrorists only have to be right once. Mm. And everyone else is is relying on us, SEAL Team 6, that we're never wrong. 
to put that on uh, in perspective, you know, when you listen to people like this, Candace tweeting from her laptop and, and enabled by technology that was invented at Bell Labs, that was uh, the byproduct of the space race, which she also denies moon landings and, and so forth. Yeah. We're not in new age. We're, we're in an, we're in a pre-scientific age where people can unfortunately spread not scientific truth, via scientific proof, which Eric, I'm sorry to say, I, my academic genealogy goes back 17 generations. Every single one of those people, including my students, I'm now in my third generation. I have graduate students that have their own graduate students. They've all been through peer review. Brian comes through as the only scientist on the panel to scold Tom for encouraging people to arbitrarily distrust scientists and clap back at Eric for his bullshit narrative about peer review. People spew lies on the internet 24-7, scientists are not infallible, and they should not be expected to clean up the internet's insane mess. That's for science communicators like me to do. But of course, Eric won't tolerate the dissent from his crony, so they have the most pointless argument in the history of this program. Wait, 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 oh. wait, 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 I have to respond to that. Okay, respond Brian, what you just said is not true. You know, it's just it, it, the fact is, is the that Einstein, Einstein paper was not for published the most in 1936 part, after peer review error. Sorry, that was John Tate, who was the editor at Physical Review before Simon Pasternak, before Sa uh, Sam uh, Goodschmidt. Until peer review you're, pointed you're not, out by Edding, Eddington helped out as well and said that you're, you're not, there was you're an not, error you're in the calculation. Hearing me. Peer review is not referee review. What you cite about the Royal Society is, in fact, an error introduced into the literature by Merton the f famous historian of science, uh, who is the father of the Merton, of Black Scholes Merton fame. I just don't think you know the history. Okay. I do know it, and in fact, I can invite you to go down to the Royal Institution next time you're in London, and you'll see pictures of Michael Faraday, of J.J. Thompson, of, the, of Eddington. You'll see them in front of audiences. Was there a peer review process before journals? When would oh, the journal nature that's, start? The average this, person and, is punching and, themselves and it, in the face right now. As somebody that loves you two, literally, I know both these guys. Eric, I know very well. Uh, both have been on my show. Brian, I love you guys. So I say this because I am begging you. The average person wants to chew through their TV set right now or their laptop as they're listening to this. And the reason is they don't care about this. Tom says the viewers don't care about this squabble, and he's right. Arguing over the semantics of how scientific research was reviewed before publication over the past several centuries has nothing to do with the way that the public rejects firmly established scientific principles. Eric can't help but pretend that basic science is political when it just isn't. No matter what the history of peer review is, it's how science works today, and for very good reason. Bad science shouldn't get published. End of story. Candace is about to sweep the world, and if I could just get you guys on board with the reality that we are in a very difficult moment right now where, yes, you guys are being asked to do a public service, which is to collide with these people who do not have your scientific bona fides, but the average person does not care, but they will actually listen to your collision of ideas for sure, because I took a lot away from you talking to Terrence. And the first time I heard Terrence, I was like, maybe this is genius, I don't know. Tom reminds them both that the main issue is that people fall for bullshit, and these guys should address it head on with clarity, something Eric didn't actually do during his four hours on Rogan. The world is not crying out for Candace Owen. It's crying out for where is the physician with my daughter's interests at heart? Well, that would be almost any doctor. Eric can make a boogeyman out of anything. It's possible that some people reject science because a doctor didn't care enough one time, but most people deny science because of the enormous wave of propaganda they encounter every day on every media platform. Tom is right. Eric is wrong. Where is the biologist who's willing to stand up to a Tony Fauci and say, I completely disagree? Disagree with what? He doesn't even bother to specify. Just saying the name Fauci is enough to trigger the sentiment he wants. And these consensuses are basically determined by getting rid of the people who won't shut up and who won't sit down and who won't sing from the hymnal. This choice of language is very deliberate. If 100% of scientists agree on some trivial scientific fact, it's not because that thing is true. It's because science is a religion. Sing from the hymnal. 
Preach, you brainwashed members of the Church of Scientism. He just can't help himself. He's doing exactly what Candace does. But it's time to close, and Piers wants to end with some positivity. Give me some hope for the future of science and its integrity. Well, I think the hope comes from you know, my students, the people that I work with, the incredible breakthroughs that I've been witness to, both personally and part of a team of 300 scientists that are working to uncover what happened during the first nanosecond in the cosmos's history. It's never been a more exciting time to be a, a scientist and to hear about science, it's, its best days are behind us. I think that's nonsense. On the other hand, we have to guard against conspiracy theories and, and flat earthers and all sorts of anti-vaxxers and things like that. Recognize that we do make mistakes, but science is self-correcting. And part of that self-correction mechanism has to do with being analyzed by your peers. Whatever Eric and I disagree with about in the past, today peer review is, is perhaps, as I like to say, it's the worst system for gauging scientific process, except for all the rest. Brian basically says science is doing just fine no matter what idiot conspiracy theorists think, even if scientists aren't infallible, and peer review is how science works. Tom? We are living in a reality where everybody is a publisher, everybody is going to say things, and people are screaming out for Candace Owens. I'm telling you right now, as somebody, I'm almost sure I'm going to disagree with every word out of her mouth, and yet... I am utterly fascinated by how she has already captured people in terms of their imagination, because this is what they want. As a marketer, I can tell you, you guys are terrible. Like if I have to market you, oh God, even though I look at Eric and I'm like, is this the smartest human I've ever encountered? For sure. Do I want him at my house just whispering in my ear all the things to do? Absolutely. My life would be way better. However, from a marketing perspective, oh dear God. So it's like we have a much bigger <laughs> challenge that we have to overcome. And Candace doesn't have that problem. She's electrifying. She captures what people want to hear. Well, if Eric is the smartest person Tom has ever met, he needs to get out more. But the point here is essentially that flashy, emotionally charged lies do better with the public than sterile scientific facts. Gee, what a surprise. It's almost like humans are easy to manipulate and bad faith actors do that all the time for money and political power. Who'd have thunk it? And people scream for Candace because she panders to the fundamentalist Christian base, just like Tucker Carlson, going so far as to call science a pagan faith, since pagan is a naughty word to Christians. In reality, religious science deniers just like to project their baseless faith onto a system of empiricism that is totally antithetical to faith to feel justified in choosing their emotions over facts. Candace gives them that feeling, and she is rewarded for it, because that's the world we live in. Science is about two things. Number one, the pursuit of utility. Einstein's breakthroughs matter because they give us GPS and nuclear energy. That's the only reason that they matter. Well, the problem with that attitude is that we have no idea what utility any discovery will later have, so you can't fuel discovery by an obsession with utility. What's the other thing, Tom? And the second thing mm. is... We know we're wrong about a whole lot of stuff. And so our job is just go through what are all the things we're wrong about that are stopping us. And I hope I'm not talking out of class, Eric, oh, please God. But Eric has said to me many times, we ought to be traveling the cosmos. And we aren't because string theory has gotten stuck. Exactly. So you have to get new ideas. You have to break the old paradigms in order to get the utility that you want. And if we judge every idea by its utility and not by where it comes from, we'll be in a much better place. Yes, Tom knows a lot about string theory. He totally isn't just regurgitating some tired anti-academia narrative from his friend Eric, the self-appointed smartest man alive. If it wasn't for string theory, we would be flying around in other galaxies by now. Forget the fact that our best bet for doing that would be wormholes, a direct ramification of general relativity, the paradigm that already exists and is well established. Scientists need to spend all day talking about what we are wrong about, a thing we can't possibly know until we develop newer, better science to improve upon what we know now, which itself already constitutes an enormous body of knowledge that the public refuses to engage with or learn about in any meaningful way. That's the problem, Tom, not string theory. 
Anyway, that was more or less what I expected. Eric spewed the precise bullshit script he's known for. Brian tried to defend science, but was pretty ineffectual. Tom made a couple decent points, but ultimately doesn't know what science is or does. And Piers didn't push back on anything, but patted himself on the back for hosting such a provocative and important discussion. As for me, since I was supposed to be there, I think I'll take this opportunity to share some of the thoughts I would have expressed. To start, I had hoped to work in this quote from Isaac Asimov. There is a cult of ignorance in the United States, and there has always been. The strain of anti-intellectualism has been a constant thread, winding its way through our political and cultural life, nurtured by the false notion that democracy means that my ignorance is just as good as your knowledge. This quote is from 1980, and it's been echoed by other great thinkers like Carl Sagan, who spoke about the public being unable to grasp the technology we all use every day and having no ability to set their own agenda or ask the right questions, culminating in a celebration of ignorance. He said that in 1995. Even these two could not have foreseen how bad this has gotten in the 21st century, with people now questioning the shape of the earth and the validity of basic arithmetic. This anti-science fervor makes us easy to manipulate, because any contrarian message is bought en masse, no matter who is telling it or what their motives are. We are witnessing a multimodal anti-science empire operating through mass media and legislation, moving towards state-sanctioned pseudoscience. And we don't have to speculate as to how harmful this can be. We have history to reflect upon. Persecution of scientists under Stalin was widespread. Lysenko was a non-scientist who was promoted to a high scientific position under Stalin's regime, and who convinced Stalin that genetics and relativity were evil. He denied the existence of genes. To address agricultural problems, he promoted a pseudoscientific practice called vernalization, and millions died of starvation as a result of crop failures. Scientists who refused to renounce genetics were left destitute or even executed. Are we at risk of repeating such events? Absolutely. Let's face reality. Trump is going to win the election. Could he bring a Lysenko-like figure into his cabinet and begin persecuting real scientists? Absolutely. Will he try to expand executive power and abuse his position to the point of authoritarianism? Probably. And there are plenty of wealthy people who will help him try to do that. I won't go into detail about Project 2025, but it's not a conspiracy. It's a real plan to move America into the first stages of Christian theocracy, and it's already underway. This is the evil upon our doorstep, and while it should receive far more attention than people like Terrence Howard, we should recognize that it's all different shades of the same phenomenon. Anti-science sentiment does not arise out of thin air. Science is becoming increasingly more complicated and therefore difficult for the public to understand. And some people lash out due to the discomfort this produces. But more importantly, there are vested interests in promoting this mentality stemming from Republican-funded think tanks. The deliberate sculpting of a populace that is not only science illiterate, but actively hostile towards science. Denial of climate change is in the interest of energy producers. Denial of basic evolutionary biology is in the interest of Christian theocrats. These efforts go all the way up the ladder to figures like the Koch brothers. I'm not saying Terry's funded by the Koch brothers, but he rides this prevalent attitude of reality denial and hostility toward any form of expertise to this bizarre prominence that now has people questioning second grade math. To wield an agenda that is in opposition with science, one must popularize the notion that science is wrong and evil. Universities, the places where you gain knowledge, are evil. Don't go there and learn things so that you can figure out how to resist our brainwashing, and also how to organize and topple our political structures. Universities are famously places that stand up against the powers that be, so they must be demonized. It is a successful campaign because many people are happy to have a reason to not learn anything and cling to primitive beliefs without basis or self-scrutiny. It goes without saying that religion is a primary driver of anti-science mentality because scientific progress, particularly as of late, has challenged many religious narratives, such as immaculate divine creation. This triggers fear of mortality as their narrative is eroded and they lash out in precisely the same way as one would defend themselves against physical violence, with hostility and tribalism.
At the same time, this is not purely a religious issue. It has at this point completely permeated secular politics. I myself am not a Democrat, and I no longer vote Democrat out of total disillusionment with the party, as it does not have the best interests of the American people in mind. But the Republican Party is cartoonishly apocalyptic in comparison. Know nothing, proudly stupid, in denial of truly all science, actively pushing us back into the Dark Ages in terms of both ignorance and authoritarian control by the Church. In the wake of this, to pretend that idiots like Terry should be given a voice is preposterous. He is not the culprit, but he exacerbates larger trends already in place. He does not deserve a platform, he is not part of any legitimate conversation, and most of the figures with any kind of expertise that shoehorn their way into the conversation have ulterior motives as well, and only serve to further confuse the public, like Eric. So let's get down to brass tacks. What is anti-intellectualism at its core? It boils down to three principles. 1. Religious anti-rationalism, essentially emotions over facts. 2. Populist anti-elitism, or the rejection of intellectual institutions. And three, instrumentalism, the belief that pursuit of knowledge only serves practical means, namely profit. This movement intends to halt the acquisition of new knowledge that would undermine groups with power and privilege. Misinformation that benefits those in power is perpetuated, and those who speak truth to that power are preemptively character assassinated. The educational sphere is not completely blameless, admittedly. Part of the disdain towards academia is fostered by the increasingly high cost of education, but this is not in itself a justification for abandoning the sanctity of centers of knowledge. Corporations do not have their financial interests challenged when the public cannot even identify the issues that they are harmed by, thus perpetuating their own subjugation. We can historically blame the fossil fuel industry, the tobacco industry, and so forth, but we do not extend this to scientific knowledge itself. Politicians, corporations, and religious institutions stand to benefit the most from promoting anti-intellectualism. They enact the politicization of nonpartisan issues, polarizing things like climate change so severely that simply acknowledging basic science gets one ostracized. This spills over into the social realm just as easily. Anti-intellectualism breeds nationalism, or the same blind allegiance to a governing body that is actively sowing the seeds of division. This is the reason for equating Black Lives Matter or any other kind of social justice with fascism, and the justification for this always involves inventing violent intent out of thin air. This in turn is used to justify a militarized police force under the guise of protection. And lastly, anti-intellectualism promotes being skeptical towards perceived authority while demanding that people blindly follow demagogues who are amplified by social media. People who fall into this way of thinking will place an unreasonable level of skepticism on the body of knowledge produced by tens of thousands of scientists operating all over the world under every type of government and in both the public and private sector. Yet they place absolutely zero scrutiny on the figures who confidently feed them the narratives they enjoy, which are riddled with distortion and fabrication almost without exception. These people find comfort in the strength and confidence such figures can convey in an appeal to shared beliefs. That's why Trump famously stated that he could shoot someone in the middle of Fifth Avenue and he wouldn't lose any voters, because their idolization of him is emotional, not logical. As far as Eric, I won't go into much detail because soon I will do a long video on him and his brother outlining their entire ethos in great detail, but it will suffice to say that Eric's hard-on for denigrating peer review is just a cover for the scientific community rejecting his theory of everything because it just isn't worth anything. Rest assured, I will go into more detail about this than you want to hear in a future video, so hold out for that. I will also discuss his blatant pandering to a conspiratorial base regarding COVID origins, COVID vaccines, and related issues, as well as the lazy tropes about trans people and other culture war mainstays, and even obvious propaganda like intelligent design. He did legitimize Terry by pretending there is any merit to his insanity and outright stating that everything he says is nonsense on this program does not undo the damage that he did on Rogan by failing to explain how everything Terry says is wrong in a way that the average viewer can understand even a single time in four hours. For everyone pretending that I was critical because Eric didn't call Terry a moron to his face, you're totally off the mark. In my content, I explained basic arithmetic, 
algebra, chemistry, and physics with extreme clarity. That's what needed to be done, and it's what I would have done for the sake of Joe and the viewers. Instead, Eric took someone that might as well be a lunatic on a street corner wearing footy pajamas and shouting into a megaphone and pretended that he deserves to be part of the scientific discourse. In the end, and here comes Dave the Broken Record, anti-science mentality and reality denial is the single greatest threat facing mankind. Take a movie like Don't Look Up. Though obviously satirical, the manner in which the general public in this modern era would react to any existential threat was depicted magnificently. There is no issue that could be more nonpartisan than a comet coming to kill us all. And yet, the comet was hyper-politicized. People were brainwashed into believing the comet didn't exist, and a megalomaniacal tech oligarch fucked us all. In my estimation, that is roughly what would happen if there were another far deadlier pandemic or some other such situation. And the culprit is not the scientific community. It's the pundits and demagogues who abuse the power of the internet to warp public perception of reality. People like Rogan are not the main culprits, but they also are not blameless and deserve their share of criticism for amplifying the chaos for monetary gain. And sadly, other than directly neutralizing sources of disinformation and promoting general science literacy, I don't have a meaningful solution to this doomsday recipe. I don't know how to fundamentally change human nature to be either less corrupt and manipulative or less blindly credulous. I will admit my youthful optimism has been diminished as I enter middle age, but I'm not giving up just yet. So those are some things I would have said on Piers Morgan, at least if I could get a word in edgewise over Eric Weinstein. Maybe I'll get another chance to go on the program, but something tells me I probably won't. Luckily, I can say whatever I want right here, and I'm going to keep doing that for quite a long while. I'll see you next time.